My first close encounter with elephants began in 1996 on a visit to Africa. I was invited to take part in a National Science Foundation lion study. Virtually all of South Africa's big game had been extirpated. In preparation for the waves of ecotourists eager to visit post-apartheid landscapes, large-scale wildlife reintroduction programs were underway. Our task was to help evaluate the ecological impacts of this massive undertaking. The experience was extraordinary. Little did I realize it would put me on a transformative path, eventually leading me to Alan and you all today. Before I begin discussion of elephant PTSD and its implications for science, society, and self, let me share a glimpse of what was to become a defining moment on this journey. I had not been on the continent very long when, at one of South Africa's stunning parks, my colleagues and I sat in desultory afternoon conversation. Day hung in the golden hours between morning's vigor and the weary vigil of night when lions sleep, baboons groom, and wildebeest tails twitch idly. We had finished lunch and were about to leave for the field to look for lions. I went to fetch a notebook from my room, but spontaneously decided to stop in at the park gift shop. A young woman sat at the lintel. We exchanged smiles and she gestured me in. The shop was filled with the usual carved lion and hippo emblazoned t-shirts, trinkets, and postcards. My eye was caught by a wooden rhino standing defiantly on a shelf. His armored body was painted in bright lacquered colors of South Africa's flag, red, green, blue, gold, white, and black. I bought the rhino and paid in fumbling currency. Within minutes, the woman and I sat beside each other, laughing in touch and voice. I lost track of time until I heard a call from outside beckoning. We rose, hugged, and agreed to meet at the kitchen on my return. Rhinoceroses were to appear very shortly again in conversation. I jumped into the Land Rover and sat wedged between the biologist and park guide as we bumped and jostled along rutted, brush-lined dirt roads. Shouting over the engine noise on our Mr. Toad's wild bush ride, the park ranger described the lions we were about to see. He then began to tell me about strange recent happenings in the park. Over the past months, gored and dead bodies of both endangered white and black rhinoceroses had appeared with startling regularity. At first it was thought that the wrongdoers were poachers, hungry for rhino harns prized for their medicinal powers. But no such mutilation was observed. The rhinos were intact. Soon, corroborated by a passing tourist stray snapshot, it was confirmed that the perpetrators were not the usual suspects, but elephants. These were strange tidings indeed, for while elephants are well respected for their formidable might, they are known for pacific natures and herbivory. Our conversation about wildlife crime ended abruptly when the truck turned a bend and we came upon the purpose of the outing, a visual banquet of sleeping lions. Upon return, I hurried down to meet my new friend from the gift shop. The kitchen was filled with banging pops and clattering ladles, blended with music blasting from a small radio on the window shelf. Faces looked up and hands waved as I was introduced around. As we sat and drank tea, my friend told me about her family, her father who had to leave to work in the mines, her mother who had stayed with the four children working laundry, and her brothers jailed and killed. Times were hard, she said. I asked, less a question than an exclamation, how did you manage? Reaching out with both hands to hold mine, she smiled and said, I chose life over survival. Weeks later, I returned to the U.S., my mind swimming with a collage of images and voices, but the two encounters and conversations threaded by the iconic rhino stayed with me. By the time I began doctoral work in psychology, the number of elephant-caused rhino deaths had reached a staggering 100 or more. There was no longer any question that the culprits of rhino sexual assaults and killings were young African elephant bulls. Such stranger-than-fiction events are typically relegated to tales told round the campfire, legends of wonder and awe, but dismissed as having any relevance to real science. 
but this case was different. The number of serial rhinoceros killings transformed anecdote into scientific fact. Today the underlying cause for the elephant's hitherto undocumented acts seems straightforward. But at the time, animal post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, was not included in the lexicon of animal behavior. It required a psychological examination of the perpetrator's biographies to provide the answer. Historically, elephants are born into the nucleus of a natal family, comprised of a matriarch who leads the group, mothers, and a constellation of allo mothers or aunties and siblings. Females remain within the natal family, but young male elephants leave, on average, between the ages of 8 to 11 years to engage in a second phase of relational shaping under the tutelage of and association with an all-bull group. This normative pattern of elephant society was absent in every one of the rhinocidal elephants. All had experienced abnormal developmental context and suffered a series of shock and relational traumas. As infants, they had witnessed the deaths of their mothers and families in culls, were prematurely weaned and orphaned at three years old or less, and then translocated by truck to unfamiliar environments. These events derailed the elephant's experience from the normative track of attachment structures and processes. In Allen's terse neurobiological shorthand, the young bull suffered from trauma-induced amygdala hypothalamic sympathetic hyperarousal with a weakened right orbital frontal inhibitory system. My research and queries to diverse colleagues in Africa and Asia revealed that the events in South Africa were not isolated, but part of a disturbing systemic pattern. Elephant PTSD was epidemic on both continents. Interspecific violence, elephant-on-elephant -elephant killing, infanticide, infant neglect, alcoholism, and a suite of attendant symptoms were observed around the world. We were witnessing the expression of historical trauma in elephants the legacy of nearly half a millennium of human violence that began with European colonization. Free-living elephant symptoms had converged to those of their captive counterparts. Unable to accommodate human demands externally, wildlife was changing inside. As Viktor Frankl observed, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Additional to brutal beatings, isolation, torture, and harsh unnatural conditions, all elephants in labor camps, zoos, circuses, and other entertainment venues experience similar relational traumas. The severity, duration, and hostage nature of their trauma nearly always evokes a diagnosis of complex PTSD, common to human prisoners and victims of tortures. Prakriti Kali is one such example. She is a young elephant in Nepal. She was captive-born for use as a forest laborer. Many such elephants are literally worked to death, at times pumped with amphetamines or other substances to prevent natural collapse. Prakriti Kali, now 10 years old, was separated from her mother at the age of four. Mother and daughter are chained 20 feet apart from each other and never allowed to touch or commune. Carol Buckley, founder and director of Elephant Aid International, describes how Prakriti Kali, denied her profound need to be united with her family, assumes a grotesque, unnatural, pretzel-like position, accompanied by urgent squeaking whenever her mother and brother return from the forest. However, while stereotypy, self-injury, major depression, infanticide, general anxiety disorders, and other trauma-related symptoms are rife in captive animals, it was shocking to discover that life in the wild had devolved into a similar state. What conservationists observed on the outside, habitat loss, culls, hunting, translocation, capture, and various forms of human hostility, was happening inside elephant minds and society. The discovery of elephant PTSD was newsworthy but unsurprising. Science has long established that non-human animals share with us comparable capacities that create a vulnerability to PTSD. More than 150 years ago, Charles Darwin described this understanding. Man and the higher animals, especially primates, have several instincts in common. All have the same sense, intuitions, and sensation. Similar passions, affections, and emotion. Even the more complex ones, such as suspicion, emulation, 
gratitude, and magnanimity. They possess the same faculties of imitation, attention, deliberation, choice, memory, imagination, and the association of ideas. Since Darwin, a steady accumulation of scientific theory and data have created a vast literature, recently substantiated by neurosciences, that articulates a transspecies psychology. In the words of the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, crafted by leading neuroscientists at the Francis Crick Memorial Conference, United Kingdom, in July 2002, quote, humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness, end quote. The document details a taxonomically extensive list, including mammals, birds, reptiles, and invertebrates, such as the octopus. As Eric Jarvis, Duke School of Medicine, puts it, the bird brain is a reptile brain, or the reptile brain is a bird brain, and they are both analogous to the mammalian brain, having comparable capacities and function. Similar to William James' observation that individuality builds but accidental fences, psychobiological models based on species separations are also accidental. The continuity of consciousness that we share with other animals is starkly revealed in chimera research that erases species delineations in the hybridization not only of body but mind. We also see the powerful fluidity of consciousness in the context of cross-fostering, the rearing of one species by another. As my study on the relationship between chimpanzee developmental psychology and post-trauma repair patterns shows, self-identity varies smoothly along a bicultural continuum. However, the most profound revelations to emerge from the discovery of elephant trauma are less about other animals than they are about ourselves. First, the formal diagnosis of elephant PTSD that rigorously conforms to DSM criteria reveals a deep and inconvenient secret in the scientific family. On one hand, science runs on the understanding of human-animal psychological comparability. Animal models, the use of cats, rats, dogs, monkeys, frogs, and so forth, in lieu of humans to probe the nature of our own minds and bodies, form the engine of biomedical research that underlies studies of human attachment, psychobiology, and trauma. We study animal pain to understand our own. On the other hand, scientists sidestep the fact that the psychological capacities qualifying animals as human surrogates are the self-same criteria used to prohibit such practice on our own species. Elephant PTSD uncovered this glaring inconsistency. Prior bi-directional inference, recognition that the attribution of human qualities to non-humans is equally as valid as the converse, was dismissed as biased. Elephant PTSD showed that making inference from human experience to that of other animals is not only scientifically accurate, but already implicit in the interpretation of animal models. Subsequently, the establishment of transspecies psychology was necessary not because of any new scientific insight. It was necessary to render visible the fact that prevailing scientific conventions use theory and data selectively. Transspecies psychology nullifies selective science by open recognition of the full body of knowledge that articulates a unitary, cross-species model of brain, mind, and consciousness. There are several implications. There is no scientific need to separate non-human and human-animal studies. Transspecies psychology subsumes the fields of animal behavior and ethology. Elephants and other non-human animals are psychological who, similar to us, express through diverse modalities, of which behavior is only one. To speak of animal behavior in the absence of a psychological framing is an act of silencing violence and objectification. Further, as psychiatrist Judith Herman observes in the case of human trauma, elephant and other animal PTSD are linked to sociopolitical movements. Species unification, under a common scientific umbrella, logically extends to a comparable ethical and legal model, subjecting non-human animals to experiments and practices prohibited in humans, comprises not only scientific inconsistency, but a profound ethical breach. In short, transspecies psychology reveals that science, absent its selective use, has emerged as the intellectual architecture of animal rights. 
There are additional challenges raised by elephant PTSD that delve even deeper and closer to home. Historically, other animals and nature on the whole have been assigned the role of counterpoint to Western culture's point. Nature plays backdrop upon which the drama of human lives is played. Similar to a Carson or Jeeves, nature is expected to be immutable, forgiving, steadfast, and always present to attend humanity in sickness and in health. By altering the face of nature, the diagnosis of elephant PTSD vanquishes this comforting sense of self and place. The reservoir that once seemed to possess infinite capacity to absorb human violence and abuse has overflowed. Elephant PTSD has stolen our illusions. Modernity's customs and creations no longer stand as monuments of human progress. Rather, they transform to vestigial wrecks of a civilization gone wrong. A glance at the growing list of extinctions clearly shows that the world is changing. However, while their physical forms may have disappeared from the face of the planet, images of vanquished species remain intact. The great auk is still the great auk, the Chinese river dolphin itself, and so on. But elephants and other living wildlife, while not yet physically extinct, are undergoing psychological extinction. On the outside, majestic elephants spied from the vantage of an ecotourist van or television documentary may appear like their ancestors of old, but inside they bear scant resemblance to the past. Elephant PTSD has altered our archetypal memories. Attachment theory and traumatology explain the disparity between inner landscapes and outer form in the language of neurons, genes, and biochemistry. We become what we experience, not only individually but through the cascade of relational moments gathered over lifetimes. The tender parental caress, dance of conversation, images when eye meets eye, the sensation when scent meets sensor, synergistically anneal like so many water lilies to create a relationally coherent narrative of consciousness, generation after generation. When the relational landscape changes, so do we. Prior to colonization, African elephant consciousness mirrored the unfenced expanse of the continent. Elephant civilization was a dense, intricate, multi-dimensional relational network of millions upon millions who were comparably bound to all other creatures and nature's rhythms. Experience occurred in tandem embedded in this space-time matrix of infinite relationships. Elephants developed and evolved in a pulsing William Jamesian continuum of cosmic consciousness, a pro-social, collective, interdependent community of the world before that Darcia Narvez refers to as the ancestral mammalian milieu. Each elephant was a self-similar fractal who embodied all elephant consciousness, much in the same way as many tribal cultures, who, as Calvin Luther Martin describes, effortlessly negotiate the porous, wafer-thin membrane separating Homo sapiens from the other. When their lands and lives were carved with colonial knives and plows, elephant minds and those of tribal humans suffered a shared fate. Anguished somatic voices of elephants echo in human tribal communities worldwide. In 2006, 18 years after first contact with outside humans, over half of the Columbian Nukok tribe had perished from rampant disease and suicide. In Brazil, there is at minimum one Guarani suicide every week. The majority of the victims are near the ages of the young rhino-killing elephant bulls, between 15 and 29 years old. The youngest recorded victim was only nine years old. Rosalino Ortiz speaks of his people's experience. The Guarani are committing suicide because we have no land. We don't have any space anymore. In the old days we were free. Now we are no longer free. So our young people look around them and think there's nothing left and wonder how they can live. They sit down and think. They forget. They lose themselves and then commit suicide. These words serve for elephants and other wildlife as well. 
social coherence and elasticity have been lost and scarred under the tread of historical trauma. The rhino-killing elephant teams are orphaned remnants of consciousness after centuries of genocide and exodus. Elephant PTSD emerges as a scientific condemnation of human modernity. The witnessing of global disintegration and elephant PTSD have catalyzed a Cunian scientific and cultural revolution of unprecedented dimensions that leaves no witness unscathed. As the face of nature changed, so has human identity. Much of modern humanity has defined itself by what other animals appear to lack. Now with an understanding of oneness, kin under skin, fin, feather, and fur, we are challenged by two pressing questions. Who are we? And how are we to live? There is a third that I am often asked. Will elephants heal? I will address this last question because its answer serves the other two. Yes, as Dame Daphne, founder of the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, Nairobi, Kenya, has shown, with her ability to heal hundreds of orphaned elephants, elephants can heal. But they will heal only if each one of us, every one of us, is willing to trade survival for life. This was the point of the young woman at the South African gift shop. Her story and those of elephants and others are not chronicles of survival eked out of misery, but a fierce embrace of life. Life in the plural is the common thread linking the narratives of trauma and their neuropsychological underpinnings. Let me elaborate further with the stories of Minnie and Marco. From infancy, Minnie lived as a circus elephant, hideously beaten, chained, and tortured. After four decades, she and a group of other elephants were rescued and brought to sanctuary. To her horror, Carol Buckley, founder and then director of the sanctuary, saw Minnie inflict pain on and abuse other elephants in the same ways and locations on the body employed by Minnie's human trainers. Carol is no stranger to elephant trauma, yet it was the first time that she witnessed an elephant internalize the identity of her abuser. Minnie made the choice to forfeit elephant life in favor of human survival. In contrast, the Moluccan cockatoo Marco refused to yield his avian identity. Captured, torn from his kin, and sold into possession, Marco lived five years in the black loneliness of a windowless garage, confined in a cage barely larger than his body. He was eventually rescued, but gone with a raucous and joyous native repertoire of a wild parrot. The only sound Marco made was that of a closing door. But in Sanctuary, he refused survival. Similar to many parrots rescued to Sanctuary, Marco chose life with endless tender care for others. And so finally did Minnie. Gradually, in the peace and security of the Sanctuary milieu, Minnie was able to shed the identity of her abusers. She was able to access the seedbed of elephant consciousness once again and revitalize. She spends her remaining years tending to her ailing sister elephants. In a culture of transient living and disposable relationships, where the individualized self reigns supreme, it may be difficult to grasp the depth of Minnie's psychological transformation. But attachment theory and the interdisciplinary annealing that it has helped catalyze teach that the wellspring of life does not lie in one person or the other, but in the space between. Neither is it privileged by one species or another. In the words of neurophilosopher Alva Noe, the life is not inside the animal. The life is the way the animal is in the world. So yes, my answer is yes. Elephants can recover. We can recover. But only if we are willing to relinquish the mandate of human survival in favor of life of other animals. The way forward is the way back, by returning to a way of life modeled on elephant ethics and values. Restore our consciousness to that of elephants of old. Renewal will come, as Dr. Pim Van Lamo writes, only when we acquire another consciousness, when the power of love becomes stronger than our love for power. Minnie, Marco, 
Primo Livi's Camp Conrad Lorenzo, and so many others forced to relate to life through experiencing near death, dared to live for someone outside themselves. The wild ones emerge radiant, teaching the need for emulating, not pitying, those who have suffered so mightily. Their testimonies eschew monuments commemorating survival in the bloody past. Instead, they urge those of us who remain to live, not just survive. Activist John Seed offers this antidote to what can become overwhelming and paralytic despair. I try to remember that it's not me trying to protect the rainforest. Rather, I am part of the rainforest protecting itself. I am that part of the rainforest recently emerged into human thinking. We are not alone if we live for and through love.